Okay, uh, good afternoon. So this week New Zealand assumes the rotating presidency of the United Nations Security Council. Uh, this means we'll chair the council for the month of July. Uh, New Zealand is proud of its role on the UN Security Council so far. As the council is a body that deals with global crises, much of our time in the past six months has been taken up by conflicts such as those in Syria, Yemen and Libya. Uh, with regards to uh, Syria, the Council is maintaining its pressure on the Assad regime over its alleged use of chemical weapons and obstruction of humanitarian assistance. New Zealand has played a leading role in calling for improved access to besieged areas, home to more than 440,000 people, and for a stop to attacks on medical personnel trying to deliver that aid. In Yemen, with the Saudi-led airstrikes continuing in the worsening humanitarian situation, we've called for political talks to resume and for more humanitarian assistance uh, for the victims. We're also chairing the Council's Al-Qaeda Sanctions Committee, responsible for overseeing sanctions imposed on those associated with the terror group. This includes sanctions against ISIL. There have also been a focus on the ongoing conflicts in Africa, including in South Sudan and the Central African Republic. Around the globe, the UN has about 16 peacekeeping operations currently. This month, New Zealand's involved in negotiations to renew the UN mandates for Mali, Darfur and the Golan Heights. Next month, we'll be looking at mandates in Cyprus and Somalia. We're seeking improvements to the way peacekeepers can manage the risks they face when maintaining order and protecting people in conflict zones around the world. The focus on those areas will remain during our presidency. Chairing the Council means New Zealand can promote some of the issues we've campaigned on uh, to win the Security Council seat. This includes the peace and security of small island developing states. Despite making up 15% of UN membership, only three small island developing states have served on the Security Council over the last 25 years, none of these from the Pacific. Such states really have the opportunity to be heard on the range of challenges they're confronted by. These include cyber and transnational crime, the exploitation of resources and the effect of climate change. Putting that open debate on the Council's agenda will allow those states to address the global community and outline their concerns and ideas themselves. Uh, the disputes between the Israelis and the Palestinians is one of the most long-standing and intractable issues on the Council's agenda. While not everyone agrees, we believe the Council has a role to play in getting both sides back to the table. New Zealand is among a relatively small group that enjoys excellent relations with both Israel and Palestine. Over recent months, we've been looking constantly for opportunities to find a way in which the UN Security Council can jumpstart negotiations on the Middle East peace process. We also want to use our presidency to draw attention to what we see as failings of the Council and do our bit to encourage members to consider how we can improve things. New Zealand's permanent representative to the UN Jared Van Behaven will be the Council's spokesman during the Presidency and Minister McCulley will also travel to New York in July. We stood for the UN Security Council because we believe New Zealand can make a positive difference to world affairs and provide a unique and independent voice at the world's top table. We've been doing that for the last six months and our stint as President uh, will allow us to build on that. Uh, just in terms of this week, from 1 July, a number of changes come into effect which will benefit New Zealanders. Uh, starting Wednesday, all children under 13 will have access to free GPs, uh, visits and prescriptions. The average motor vehicle levy, including the annual licence fee and petrol levy, will fall from around about $330 to $195 per year. And paid parental leave payments will increase. For those who are eligible, the maximum weekly rate will go from $504.10 to $516.85. More funding will also be available to hospices to help them expand palliative care services to better support terminally ill people at home and in aged care facilities. These are, there are, these are yet more examples of how a growing and vibrant economy is delivering real benefits to families. Just uh, in terms of this week, we'll con and the House will continue the third reading debate of the Harmful Digital Communications Bill and the committee stages of the Environmental Reporting Bill and New Zealand Superannuation and Retirement Income Amend Bill. As for my own movements, I'm here for Christian Time tomorrow and Wednesday before heading up to Auckland. On Thursday I'll be in Christchurch where I'll have a number of meetings and visits and will deliver a speech to the Canterbury Chamber of Commerce before heading back to Auckland uh, where I'll also be on Friday. Prime Minister, just looking at the uh, horizon.
Morrison Housing interest in the state housing stock. Do New Zealanders have anything to worry about in terms of Australians um, owning and managing the state housing stock? Uh, in my view, not in the least. I mean, uh, you know, it's a theoretical thing at this point because Horizons actually haven't put in a bid and they you know, have come to New Zealand, I think, for a bit of a recce of what's uh, possible. But look, in the end, they are a not-for-profit charity based in Australia. Uh, they've been uh, successful, as I understand it. They've got uh, significant expertise and I can't see why they, in theory at least, couldn't play a role in terms of the provision of social housing. Sure. So what's your message to uh, a state house tenant? You know, should a tenant be worried that the landlord changes from the New Zealand government and the New Zealand taxpayer to an Australian entity? No, I don't think there will be anything for them to be concerned about. Uh, at the end of the day there will be a contract ultimately for any of the community housing providers. Uh, so you know, whether they are an Australian based charity or ultimately whether they are iwi or whether they are some other New Zealand based charity, in the end they'll have conditions they need to meet. And the purpose of what the government's really doing is we're looking to shed some of our stock in certain locations around the country, in Vicargo as an example, and we're looking to reinvest that capital in other initiatives the government's got. We also believe that there's a really legitimate case that these social housing providers can provide, um, if not as good a job, arguably a better job than potentially housing New Zealand can. So, so this, Australia, this Australia, this Australia. The Australian less privileged will be the beneficiary of this, given that this uh, Horizon uh, group will repatriate the money to Australia to uh, advantage, <coughs> disadvantage there. Well, firstly, we're quite a long way ahead of ourselves because they haven't actually no, put, they in, do it. put in a bit. Um, not necessarily, I'd actually argue it would be the other way around because um, they will have to export capital to New Zealand uh, to fund at least the deposit part of what they're doing. And that arguably is capital that was earned in Australia. So rather than New Zealanders exporting capital to Australia, it's the other way around. It's Australians um, exporting capital to New Zealand to invest in our um, social housing provision. But what about, would you put any guarantees around that in terms of the contract, in terms of, um, would, you, would you make uh, Horizon Housing or any overseas entity that wants to get involved reinvest any profits from New Zealand back in New Zealand? Would you put that guarantee on? on no, I don't think you'd want to do that, um, for a variety of reasons. Firstly, the capital flows are likely to be much, much larger coming this way than going the other way, because as I said, you know, they're going to have to pony up with a pretty big deposit, and that's money they will have earned not in New Zealand. Uh, and that money will be used for the provision of social housing for New Zealanders, so that's a positive. Second thing is we don't, we don't have those conditions on other charities. There are many charities and non-profit organisations that raise money in New Zealand and they expatriate to other countries for other charities or causes or whatever they're working on. So I don't think you, you would do that. Um, I mean the question ultimately is, you know, uh, firstly, is the system perfect at the moment? I think the answer to that is no. Um, is there a strong case that someone else could do at least as good a job as House in New Zealand, if not better? The answer to that I think is potentially yes. And do these people have a proven track record? The answer is yes. So there's no particular reason why they should be ruled out. There's no particular guarantee either that they'll either be successful or ultimately want to do this. But the situation could arise, couldn't it, whereby uh, Horizon Housing is a not-for-profit. It, it reinvests all its profits back into its own services. So the scenario could easily arise where they um, make a profit off a house in South Auckland and then put that back into one of their houses on the Gold Coast. That could happen, couldn't it? But if you're looking at cash flows, I mean, I haven't looked at their numbers and they haven't even put in a bid, but if you just looked at cash flows, I'd strongly suggest it would take a very, very long period of time before the cash flows would be going to Australia. The cash flows are all going to be coming to New Zealand. Are you talking about them as a, a possible landlord only or? Would, if they put a bid in, would they have to provide social services as well? Uh, no, they don't have to provide other social services, but they could potentially provide other social services, either of their own accord or in conjunction with someone else. I mean, one of the potential options here is that there are consortiums that are that join together with a number of interested parties. I'm not saying they will or they won't, because we simply don't know, we haven't even seen whether they're going to put in a bid. But in theory, the first and, and primary thing they have to demonstrate is that they will be a social housing provider. It's the provision of those houses for those in need that is the primary driver and they can't do anything else with the houses other than provide social housing. But whether they provide other services, that, that's a matter for them, but that all weighs into whose bid is likely to be accepted and whether they're likely to be successful.
if the cash flow is, is mainly going to be coming this way, as you say, it will be. Yeah. What's in it for Horizon then? Why? Why, why would they bother? Well, because A, I think they're obviously a not-for-profit charity that believes very strongly in what they're doing, which is providing you know, accommodation for uh, individuals who are in need. Uh, lots of not-for-profit organisations spread their wings around the world, so they don't necessarily just stay in one location. We can point to many organisations that are like that. Secondly, they probably do argue that they have some real expertise, so yep, they're building an asset, but that's an asset that ultimately they can use uh, maybe for extension in New Zealand, who knows what they'll ultimately do with that. But uh, my main point to you would be that you know we want good social housing providers, they can do that, but if there's a cash flow argument, the cash flow is coming to New Zealand, it would be for a hell of a long period of time. Is the government um, looking more at uh, leasing uh, the state land to community housing providers rather than trying to sell the land, given that there seems to be Pretty high value Do you mean in economy. terms of these four to five hundred hectares that we've been looking at, or um, both that and also the, um, the, the housing New Zealand um, housing <coughs> land that we're looking to sell? Well, I think we've got the provision to be able to do that, and that was written in the cabinet documents from memory. But I haven't seen any of the proposed yet, so I can't tell you whether that's ultimately the route we'd go down. Bill English has said that some of the state housing stock could go to these community providers at a discount, you know, to yep. get them to get them um, into the game, so to speak. Will that discount be available to uh, Horizon or will that discount be available to offshore buyers as well? Well, I can only tell you what he's, he's told me, so I, I don't know exactly the context of the comments he's made to you. But, but the basic argument around the discount is that the valuation, as I understand it, these houses are in the books at is based on an individual house and on the basis that it could be disposed of for any other purpose. And because there are such tight provisions around this, in other words, it can only go to a community housing provider and can only be used for the provision of social housing, the expectation, I think, of the Minister of Finance is they would sell for a discount. So it's, it is a discount, but whether it's a discount you can ever sort of monetise is a very different issue because you're going to have to provide social housing. Yeah, but the Australians will get the discount. Well, they're going to put in, if they put in a bid, and that's a very theoretical position at the moment, if they put in a bid, then they'll, their bid would be accepted if their bid is the best bid available and we believed it was providing the best service. And in the end, those who decide whether they're successful or not will have to look at the criteria. But I guess what we're saying is that they're not ruled out because they're Australian based. Who determines the rent on the properties? Sorry? Who determines the rent on the properties? Honestly, don't know that. I mean, it'll be, um, you have to go and ask uh, the Minister yeah. of Social Housing. But when, you, sorry, when you're talking about the best bid, though, but do you have a bottom line where you wouldn't sell if you didn't think any of the bids were good enough? Yeah, I think there's always the capacity to walk away from the program. I mean, we just believe that there's a, 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 a group of state houses in various locations where we believe we could take that capital out and put it somewhere else. And for, you know, we've got a big big housing program going on at the moment for Tectonaki, for instance, where we're putting hundreds of millions of dollars. It's not unhelpful for us to better release capital and reinvest it. At what point was the government prepared um, to let um, community organisations from overseas come into this? At what point did, did that come into your thinking? Oh, I, I don't know whether it's sort of something you can say it's come into our thinking. I, what, what we're saying is here's a process we're going through. If the, you know, the other way of looking at that is are they ruled out because they're not a New Zealand-based charity? The answer is no. Yeah, so was that right from the, was that right from the beginning? Were you always prepared to let overseas-based charities come into this? Well, I haven't had a discussion with the Minister of Social Housing about it or the Minister of Finance about that particular point, but nor would I, if they spelled that out absolutely clearly, would I have said no, because I think it's logical for... It. You know, the, the test isn't the domiciliality of the individual organisation, the test is can they meet the contract that we would be disposing of these state houses on. So I guess what I'm saying is when you launched the policy in your state of the nation, were you fully prepared for an Australian buyer or a British buyer or wherever it come into this? I didn't spend a lot of time thinking about that particular issue, I was thinking about the provision of those social houses for those in need, because we want to build the amount of, state, uh, of social houses available and we do want to change the mix of the provision of those. So it isn't something I can say I spend a lot of time thinking about, but, but I'm not ruling it out and we haven't ruled it out and I don't think it's actually that relevant. I mean, 
it's a, look, some people will say they don't like Serco because they're not a New Zealand you know, head office company, but actually there's been nothing wrong. In fact, they've done a pretty good job from what I can see in terms of their provision of, of services when it comes to prisons. So when you launched this policy at your state of the nature, you hadn't thought through whether or not you cared that's not yeah. That's not the test. The test is can they provide social houses for New Zealanders? Will the amount of cash flow kept in New Zealand in any way play a part in that test? Sorry, one more time. Will the amount of cash flow kept in New Zealand in any way play a part in that test? The test is whether they can provide social houses and potentially other services either by themselves or in conjunction with others. Will that be of net benefit to New Zealand and to those people who are renting those properties? You know, that's the test ultimately. Can they do the job and do it well? As a part of the sales agreement, will the government specify a time frame which these providers must hold on and provide these houses to tenants? Don't know that, but uh, uh, you'd have to go and check with them with the Minister what the contract will ultimately look like. But the contract is for, uh, as I understand it, the, the, it's a long run contract for the provision of social houses. Do you expect other organisations um, from overseas, other charities, that are based overseas to come into this beyond Horizon House? We can't rule it out, but I can't rule it in either. In the same way, I don't think you can actually rule in the Horizons, we'll put in a bit. My understanding of it is that they've, they've come and had a bit of a look. They might be interested and they might they might progress it. They also may not. It's very much in the unproven ter territory at the moment. And is there a case here with the, with the opposition that, you know, is there a mindset issue, mindset issue here? Because if you look closely at Horizon, they obviously do a very good job. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that, I can't speak for why they disagree with what we're doing, but they disagree with most, most of what we're doing. So, you know, I guess that's why they're called the opposition. Uh, they, but the, the bottom line here is that they don't like the fact that there could be a social housing provider providing services that are currently you know, provided by Housing New Zealand. But my point to you would be the current model doesn't work very well. Um, we have quite long waiting lists, it's very sticky. Um, it hasn't been highly effective. The previous government left us with stock that was very uh, badly maintained. And actually there's, there's not always, when it comes to specialist services, maybe uh, for um, you know, certain, certain um, tenants, there's not always a total wraparound service that maybe a specific provider could provide, either on their own or in conjunction with others. So my point would be that if you go and have a look at Australia, Certain states in Australia have moved to a greater provision of social houses by social housing providers. We certainly want to grow the number of houses available because what we know at the moment is there's not enough of them. Now the government can do it either totally off its own balance sheet or it can do it with the use of other people's balance sheet. I think a mix is about right. And look at the end of the day, it's no different from the provision of lots of the assets that the government has. We don't happen to own Wirree Prison, we don't happen to own the Hobsonville, uh, two of the Hobsonville schools that are in my electorate. In the end, um, what New Zealanders want is high quality services provided to them. I think they're far less concerned about whether the government actually owns something or not. We don't own, for instance, the vast bulk of, of um, early childhood education facilities, but they provide a wonderful service for families and, and actually people like that. Could anyone set up a charity and buy these houses? For example, could Serco set up a charity and buy some? I think theoretically, yes. I mean, the test isn't, isn't that. The test is that they have to be able to provide um, social housing, uh, which is obviously funded by the government through the income-related grants and other subsidies that come there. So that's the test, really. Prime Minister, have you had any information on two New Zealanders who have been intercepted by Israeli forces off Gaza? Are these the guys that are... Um, Part of the Freedom Flotilla. Freedom, yeah. I, look, I haven't had very much information. I'm just aware that, that they were on this particular ship, but I don't know anything else other than that. Would you be getting more information? In fact, would probably provide me more, but all I know is that they're on the ship and that's the only advice I've got. Prime Minister, if you're not concerned about them, you haven't had any reason so far to be concerned about the welfare? I was only really briefly made aware of them this morning, so I don't, don't know anything else other than that. Question. Um, the price of milk, yep. we should be investigating that? No, I mean if you think about uh, milk, firstly there's no international price for liquid milk, there is obviously the wholesale milk. Um, uh, if you go and look at, uh, I think the opposition have been jumping up and down, but I think someone went in to see countdowns today and the price they were claiming was, in, I think in the UK it was selling for $3.19, well it's been selling for $3.19 in New Zealand. 
I think it's gone up nine cents on, on average for us, one of the supermarkets in the last five years. So milk prices move up and down. You have a variety of different factors. For instance, in some countries overseas, the equivalent of GST isn't applied to milk, for instance. Um, you know, in, in some countries overseas, like the UK at the moment, you've got a price war that's going on. There are a variety of different factors. But for the most part, there's a big range in what you can pay for milk from the supermarket to the dairy, but it's a pretty competitive market. Do you think it's concerning that the price of, of milk is pretty much double that of fizzy drinks? Um, well, obviously, we encourage people to drink a lot more milk than soft drink, um, and we encourage parents to encourage their children to do that. But if, that, if the argument is solely one of price, in most places in New Zealand, if not all of them pretty much, you can drink water out of the tap and that's free. So we're not like some countries in the world where the water's not safe out of the tap. So the argument is not just as simple as, as price. Well, Mr. Um, the UN Security Council visited, uh, you talk about jump-starting the Israeli testing. Yeah. Do you really believe that we can make any steps towards that in a month? What? <coughs> Of itself, you know, New Zealand, there's a limited amount we can do, obviously, because if you think about it, the US and a variety of administrations have been working on this issue for a very long period of time. It's uh, there's been a number of summits, I think, at Camp David and others to try and get the process resolved. But in the end, New Zealand's been a long-term advocate of the two-state solution, and it's a very important part of the world. And and while I accept it's a big challenge to find peace and between Israel and Palestine. Uh, the prize is so significant, it's got to be worth it if we can. So that, that's the purpose of New Zealand having its position on the Security Council, to be able to make the case for some things which you know, sometimes are difficult for people to talk about. What are you doing that month? Well, I think we can continue, which we are doing, to talk to the Americans and others about why this is so important. Prime Minister, mm -hmm. do you think people should consume less in the way of fizzy drinks? Consume less. Um, some people should definitely consume less. And uh, if you think about it, you know, obesity is a significant issue in New Zealand, it's a growing issue. And often if you see stories about people who are morbidly obese, in some cases they consume far too much in the way of fizzy drinks. So, so why would, um, if raising taxes is a good way to stop people yep. from smoking, why would a sugar tax on fizzy drinks not be a good way to stop them drinking fizzy drinks? It's primarily a thing of elast a point of elasticity. So if you think about what's happened with smoking, we've been putting up cigarettes about a dollar a packet. So I'm not a smoker, but from the best of my knowledge, so it's sort of 20 bucks a packet. So it's taken a lot to, excuse the pun, choke off that demand. Um, and, and so if you look at, say, Coke or whatever, fizzy drink at the supermarket, it's $2 or whatever for a bottle of it, you know, a reasonable two litres or whatever it is, I don't really know because I don't drink this stuff. But, but let's say you did for a moment. Um, how far would you have to take the price tag? up to actually stop people. And also when it comes to sugar, isn't it one of those things where the, you know, the consumption of too much sugar, salt or fat is a bad thing, but the consumption of some of it's okay. So yes, you could put on a sugar tax and try and use that money for an education uh, campaign, but I, I myself uh, you know, are a bit sceptical. There's, I mean, Mexico I know is applied to sugar tax. I think there may be other places that are, are certainly having a think about it. Uh, but for the most part, I reckon it would be far better for us to follow a model of better labelling, better education, more encourage, encouraging young people particularly to be more active and portion control when it comes to obesity. But that sugar tax in um, Mexico has actually reduced consumption. It's a very debatable issue I think at the moment. Um, uh, look I haven't seen the most recent data. Initially Sir Peter Gluckman said to me there was, you know, there was, it was at least mixed results but it's very early on. On the economy, uh, uh, what impact do you think the Greek crisis and the uh, Chinese um, slowdown, they've just um, these monetary policy, what impact do you think those might have on the economy and the budget? Uh, well, I think, look, if Greece leaves, leaves the euro, it could certainly have some impact on the New Zealand economy in so much that it would have a ripple effect on the global economy. I think it would have far uh, lower impact today than it would have happened a few years ago. Firstly, um, Europe generally is more stable, um, and feeling a bit more confident about its own future. I think there's less likely to be the domino effect that you would have seen a few years ago. So um, it's not great for sentiment and uh, it's something we'd have to you know, keep an eye on. Uh, but overall, the global economy is much stronger today than it was two or three years ago when this was a, a far more pronounced issue.
And in China, they're having to start Well, China, I mean, it's very difficult to know. I mean, there's a whole range of different numbers floating around about how China's really performing. But, you know, for the most part, we still think they'll achieve growth around about 7%. Prime Minister, just looking at the Security Council again, do you think issues in relation to the Islamic State and the kind of recent terror attacks, do they come up in any form while we have the presidency in terms of us having to make some sort of ruling or react in some way, do you think? Well, it's possible. Um, you know, it's always possible that those issues get brought there. I mean, ultimately, there's bound to be discussions, and what you've seen over the weekend, I think, is both terrifying and horrifying for people, because you know this is the main argument we've been making for quite some time that you know if if ISIL's activities were solely limited to Iraq and Syria, it might arguably be easier for New Zealand to turn a blind eye. Although I personally think that would be the wrong thing to do. But this is a group that wants to take the war to you. And while I accept a lot of people don't go to Iraq and Syria, people do travel to Tunisia, uh, they certainly do tra travel to Kuwait, and I did that myself just a month or so ago. So there's the worrying factor. Um, the Security Council is certainly the place to be debating this issue, but as you know, there's always going to be a range of issues, a range of views there. On the, Middle the, P5 and the Sorry, on the Middle East issue yeah. at the Security Council at the weekend, um, on the current affairs show and at the Otago Foreign Policy School, yeah. McCulley said that the Two sides, Palestine and Israel, weren't that far apart. Maybe not as far apart as yep. people thought. He came in for a bit of criticism. One of the speakers said that he was deluded and thought he was Tony Blair. Um, but what is it that leads you? I've to never thought of Murray as Tony Blair, but there you go. <laughs> what is it that leads you to believe that they're not that far apart? I mean, isn't it one of the most intractable international problems that we've seen for decades? Why well, are they I, I, look, I've seen his speech. I haven't. Um, I wasn't obviously there to, to look at all the comments in the debate. I think the point he's making is that at the heart of all of it, most people want to live in a country and a place where there's both a future and where there's, there's peace and stability and where people can feel confident to raise a family. And those emotions won't be any different for Palestinians as, or for Israelis. Um, the second thing is it's quite possible, I think, to define the major factors when it comes to the dispute. I agree, though that those issues have been on the table for a very long period of time and you know, the sharing of Jerusalem or the, you know, the establishment of, of, um, of more housing on, on the West Bank and the like, so all those issues have been around for a very long period of time. But, but there's been successive US presidents that have always believed it was possible ultimately to find a way through. I guess the only point is, yes of course it's hard, um, but does it mean that the world should give up? I think the answer to that is no. I think his main point is just that you can at least define what the contentious points are. That's the way I would have read his speech. One of the other um, themes of the conference was the, the difficulty New Zealand has interacting with security issues between the US on the one hand and with its trade imperatives with China on the other. And um, Paul Buchanan, who you know, suggested yep. that one of the ways through the dilemma would be for New Zealand to go to the five eyes and say, um, please give us an exemption from spying on China effectively. What, what's your reaction to that? Would you ever go to the five <coughs> eyes and seek for a change for New Zealand's role? Uh, well, firstly, we, we obviously, for good order, don't, don't talk about who we undertake um, our intelligence gathering activities against for very good reason. But it's known so, so, that New Zealand did have a role in China, surely. Well, let's just leave it in the hypothetical. Um, but on the basis of the hypothetical, what I'd say is no, I don't think it's likely that we would do that. I mean, we gather intelligence when we think it's in New Zealand's interest to do so. And sometimes there's a very complicated reason why we do that. Um, or there's a very um, specific reason why we do that. So I, I don't think New Zealand's likely to go and uh, say to its five eyes partners that you know various places are off limits because we believe for our trading um, purposes we're not going to gather intelligence. Does that, problem, does that create a problem for New Zealand though, the fact that its primary security interests lie in one direction with one superpower and maybe arguably its trade interests lie in another direction with a rising superpower? Yeah, I mean, I, look, it's, 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 it sort of gets distilled back down to the argument that you sometimes hear from the Greens that will say well, we shouldn't have a trading relationship with someone that we don't agree with their, for instance, their human, human rights record on. And my view of that's always been that an increased trading relationship you know, breaks down barriers and opens up opportunities for those sorts of discussions. I mean, they are different things and for different reasons. We gather intelligence for quite different 
reasons um, about individuals or about you know countries, and and I don't think we should confuse the two. But it's the first time, isn't it, in history that we've had a major a decoupling, if you like, between the people who trade with the most, the EU, Britain, Australia, yeah. and, and our security interests. Yeah, but um, a you're making lots of assumptions. And you wouldn't want to you wouldn't want to make assumptions about what we do or don't do or why we might do or don't do things when it comes to the intelligence space. You know, there may be a particular entity or a particular reason why we think it's in New Zealand's interest to do that. And sometimes it could be protecting our own interests because these things go both ways. Prime Minister, previous negotiations for Israel and Palestine have been led by the US. Is this your way of saying that they've essentially failed, and would be better if the US Security Council? No, I don't think we'd argue at all that they failed. I think we would argue very strongly that the US has shown the best leadership it possibly can in a very difficult set of circumstances. But, but my simple point is that in the end, the UN Security Council is the most important body. This is one of the more significant issues in that region, and and uh, therefore on that basis, you know, it's the right place for New Zealand as a small country with a with a good relationship with both parties to be able to say, hey, maybe we can make some progress here. That's all. And also your focus on um, small island states yep. and how climate change plays into that. Is that a deliberate um, timing with the lead up to the Paris conference? And are you hoping that outcomes on uh, the World Humanitarian Summit will play into that? Well, I think it better reflects the assurances that we gave when we were bidding for our place on the Security Council. So one of the big arguments that we made to small island developing states was that we were a kindred spirit, we'd represent their voice, we'd do a lot of listening. Climate change is certainly an issue that you know worries many of these low-lying Pacific states, so you know, it makes sense for us to fulfil both obligations, recognise that risk for them, recognise that work needs to be done, but also to have their voice heard, because they can't, as a point I was simply making, is very few of them have ever been on the council in the last 25 years, and none from the Pacific. Um, I, I think you know, we're, on, we're in the process of finalising our, um, our target to take to Paris, but I think New Zealand's record when it comes to climate change is a pretty good one. It's, Leading the world, but we're doing our fair share. Just, just, just getting, so just getting the small is. island states on the agenda, is that success, or are you looking for particular outcomes from that domain? It's hard to know, you know, exactly how successful we'll be. I mean, I think just making the case and having those discussions is important. Um, but you know, obviously, any progress we can make is, is, is good. But I don't want to over over sell that because it's just hard to know what we can achieve in that month. You're finalising those climate change targets. Um, the G7 is going for between 40 and 70 percent reduction. Can we look for something similar from the uh, Well, it depends what base you're talking about, because it won't be 40 to 70 percent off a 2000. It's off a 1990 base. I think the US target is going to be 15 percent off 1990. Talking about obviously a high number, but it's off a 2005 base. I think, secondly, you, you do have to recognise that when it comes to New Zealand, uh, we've got a, a effectively we're a developed country with a developing country's profile because half of our emissions come from agriculture. And as we all know, there aren't simple answers to that in day one. So, you know, the new, as you're probably aware, and ultimately when all the paperwork's released, you'll see that Treasury's done quite a significant amount of work uh, on, the, on the cost of the. New Zealand economy, New Zealand household, New Zealand business relative, say, to the cost of the EU of them achieving their target. And their main argument is that it's a lot cheaper for the Europeans to achieve uh, their target than it would be for New Zealand because of the makeup of our of our um, profile. Having said all of that, you know, I think we're starting to settle on a you know a pretty good outcome actually. You know, what what is both manageable for households, manageable for businesses in New Zealand, and also be shown to be playing our fair share. And will it have to involve some policy change from the government to make that happen? Um, I, mean, I think I'll, yeah, but there, are always, there are always policy initiatives that we are rolling out. Um, part, part of what will probably ultimately make the biggest difference for the New Zealanders is if, if we can actually find a solution to um, methane nitrate emissions uh, and ultimately um, if you think about it, only half of our economy is in the traditional economy and we have a very high proportion of our energy is renewable, so it's quite challenging for New Zealand. But you know, ultimately I am quite confident that the Greenhouse Gas Alliance will come up with a solution and when they do I think you'll see quite a dramatic reduction in New Zealand's emissions profile. So we've, 
short term might be fretting a little bit over something that actually science will provide an answer to, but like anything, I can't guarantee that today. Would you expect to see the price of milk drop in the future months? Would I? Um, I've got no reason to believe it ultimately will. I mean, it, I hope it does always, because lower prices are good for consumers, but, but I haven't seen any particular reason why it would. Would you expect the price of milk to be, have some relation to what's happened on wholesale markets? Um, I don't know the exact way the pricing calculation works between the international you know, whole milk powder price and ultimately what liquid milk sells for. Fonterra will answer those questions and the Commerce Commission rule is free to go and have a look at those. It matters if they think there's an issue. But you'd have to say, if you go, I mean, go back to I mean, 2010, you know, the average price from, I think when the food price index for two litres of milk was $3.36. Arguably today it's nine cents higher, three dollars forty-five. And as see the countdown, I think we're saying today that they've been selling at three dollars nineteen for the last month. I mean, it's it's a pretty it's a pretty modest increase over that period of time. You going for the Super Fifteen fund? No, I'm just um, trying to trying to work that out. Actually, I'd like to go. Um, and you'll be backing who? Well, it's a bit like judging a baby competition. Make one mother happy and everybody else never votes for you the rest of your life. So I'll think about you know, who I want to say the answer to. More voters than women. I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the truth is I'm a Blues supporter, for better or for worse, even if they are second to last. So I can go with a relatively neutral position. But uh, it'd be a great game. It's great. I think you know, the, big, the, the good part of the story is that um, hopefully it bodes well for the World Cup. Just a couple of very good teams. Just on the World Humanitarian Summit, um, what outcomes are you hoping for come? It's, uh, my understanding is it's a regional summit, so obviously Helen Clark's here, I think Jude the Bishop's over here. But I mean, look, it's just an opportunity to put a bit of a focus on an important issue in the region and feed back into, you know, into the UN's overall program. Did Julia Gillard ever take up your invite just for her, your batch? No, but I've been watching the killing season. Does that mean you've you watched it? What do you thought? As political that? junkies, I would have thought you'd all be glued to it on the ABC. I'm halfway through season two. <laughs> Is there some link between that little batch? <laughs> Not really, but she stars in the thing. It's pretty interesting. You watched it. Um, it's more exciting than this post getting the press conference. So I'll leave you go and watch it. What are your thoughts? Yeah. I'm with a watch.